out of it. So the name of the topic uh, uh, of the talk is um, what near real-time technology, when you, when you hear something like that, what it means for technology choice. So you probably hear, hear a lot of buzzwords like big data and near real-time big data and fast data and whatever. I'm not sure how it's uh, uh, about this in Serbia, but you should be prepared for these buzzwords if you didn't hear them yet. I mean, all this NSA stuff and all that um, is kind of rolling on. So the point here is that I'm kind of, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm doing work in private research and more or less paid research in this area for several years now, even before they started calling this big data. So I was into the analytical part. I've started relearning math and, and uh, trying to remind, to recall everything I learned about statistics and then I realized that I have to completely learn it again. Um, so I'm not mathematician, but I'm, I'm doing my best learning this. But this is not, not exactly the point here. The, the topic is about how, how would you separate a real, real-time analytics from what you would call typical big data analytics, whatever. I'm not into buzzwords. Um, I will try to explain you what technology you have to use and which technology choices you have to do when you have a real uh, requirement to do real-time analytics. Okay. So yes, by the way, I'm writing books um, and anybody of you who is able to, to read German is very welcome to order it on Amazon. Uh, or even not. <laughs> Seriously, it's a, it's a hobby, so you cannot make a living out of it. Okay, oh yeah, by the way, <clears throat> those of you who are older than 20, do you remember these two guys? Exactly. So let's, let's go through, through the history or let's briefly look at the characters here. So Wiley, Coyote. Um, what are the characteristics of this guy? He's pretty slow. He's running only when he has to run. Well, yes. So he has a wide field of vision, so he needs to, you know, to, to, to use every, the whole environment in order to, to catch the other guy. Do you hear me better now? Sorry. Just remind me that I, I'm, I'm not used to speak through a micro. It's like through the, this sort of micros. Um, <clears throat> so it, he has very long memory, so he tries to learn. And he's purely proactive. That means that actually the whole... Uh, animation is about him trying to do something, and the other guy's uh, high guy is just waiting. Um, well, he's always thoroughly analyzing and planning and preparing and all, all that. And it, the, the most interesting thing is that this guy always loses. He has never won. So on the other hand, the roadrunner is the complete opposite of this guy. <clears throat> he's hell fast. He's always running. He's always on the road. He has just a narrow field of vision, so he just looks uh, in front of himself. He has very short memory. We don't see really that he learned a lot, but probably he doesn't need to. We will discuss it in a little bit. He's purely reactive. He always waits for what Coyote will do and reacts on it. He is always forced to immediately decide, so he's situational. He, he needs to make a decision, the best decision at this moment of time. And he always wins. Probably this is the most interesting thing. So let's go through all this characteristic, um, well, in a little bit more depth. So what does it mean for Coyote to be slow? He's, just, he's totally into Acme, right? You, you know this? probably from different animations as well. So the point of this company, if you read it up, the existence of this company is only there for, well, the company is there to produce things that never work, that always fail. This is the reason why, why, uh, why this company actually existed in all these animations. And 
The biggest customer is probably Wile E. Coyote. <laughs> um, so what he always needs is this mumbo jumbo. He needs a lot of stuff to, to make a complex setup to try to, 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 to catch the other guy. Um, also distributed, I mean, you remember, like, I don't need to show you this animation, I don't have this video, but you remember all these setups, they are pretty complex, it's like, it has to, to happen something, then this one falls down, then uh, some, some bucket falls down, and some water gets spilled somewhere, and so on and so forth. So this is the typical ACME setup. He has very complex decisions, depending on what the runner is currently doing. But once he has planned and set this whole thing up, it's not movable anymore. So when the runner just reacts uh, spontaneously, this thing fails. So what is about the runner to be fast? He doesn't have this mumbo jumbo. He only uses his own body and his own legs, his own feet. Uh, or pawns, however you call them. So he's totally road bound, bound, so he's always on the run, he's always on the road, and this is the only thing that he sees and uses. And his decisions are pretty simple. It's like stop, run, make a step aside, depending on what is happening right now, or just do this meep meep. So what Coyote, Coyote always does is what we see is he's almost always standing around, planning, observing, preparing, like doing this. And then he, in, in the very last second, he sprints and, well, of course, fails. The runner is a non-stop system. If we cons uh, consider the runner as a system, it's a non-stop system. He never stops completely. He just maybe halts for, for a second or for, for, for just a millisecond in order to step aside or do something in order to avoid be hidden, to be, uh, being hit by, by a, a, an object. And then he just runs further after a short meep meep. And he's always searching for food. This is, this is what, what makes this road run. I mean, Coyote, on the other hand, is also searching for food, but he has only one target. This is the potential food. Roadrunner eats everything which comes away, so probably it's, it's mostly it's seed, but um, well, it depends. So the white vision of Coyote, he tries to use the whole environment, use the rocks, use the, uh, the, the animals around and stuff. And um, he tries to, uh, in a very complex way, to predict paths that runner will run. On the other hand, again, the runner, he only sees what, what's in front of his nose and what, what's on the road. And, well, he only needs, he only sees this, this short thing, this, this, this small part of the big picture, and he decides completely based on this. The long memory of Coyote, well, we actually see that he tries to learn. So, actually, I didn't see anything where he would have done the same thing twice. Well, they are all similar, but probably they are based on different Acme products. But he tries to learn, and he tries to, to, to find new tricks in order to catch the runner. The runner has a very short memory. He never learns. He doesn't need to learn. It's copy diem, so it's like live the day. He sees a, uh, well, uh, something in front of his, his nose, and this something can hurt him. So he avoids this, and then he just goes on until the next time he observes the same pattern. Um, as I told you, Coyote is a proactive system, so it plays, uh, plans and tries out and experiments and looks for, for new and new ways. And the reactiveness of, of Roadrunner is something that actually makes him live. Uh, because it's sufficient for him to exist and to remain existing. Do you remember, do you remember these complex plans here? I mean, I mean, it's not only about real time or not real time. We, we all know that plans never work, right? No matter how hard you play, uh, plan or what, whatever you plan. So it's just a roadmap, a potential. This is an exact plan how he 
we'll try to find uh, to catch this guy. Um, and he always has one shot. It's like one second where the roadrunner passes him and he has to hit them. Uh, never works. Spontaneousness of the runner is the complete opposite once again. He just immediately decides what to do. And this decision is based on two factors. First, well, not being harmed. And as a bonus of it, fooling the other guy, fooling Coyote. The maximum possible level of fooling is also important. Otherwise, it wouldn't be that much fun to watch. Okay, and we all know that no matter how hard this guy tries, he always loses, but he never stops trying. And the other guy always wins, but probably not because he's that savvy, but just because the other, guy's all, the other guy always fails on himself. So, now we are actually at the technical point. Coyote is something that you would call the batch processing. Runner is something that you would call near real-time or real-time, whatever. I will explain the term itself. Can we agree on this, the separation? Now I can just uh, go into in, in depth, in the technical depth. So what is actually batch analytics? So batch analytics, you've probably heard some Hadoop stuff and, and so on here. Um, so is, you have, the first thing is you have time. This is very important. When you don't have time, you cannot call this batch. Time means that, well, it shouldn't take 18 hours probably, but it can be done in three, it's okay. Yeah, it, it's, it, it has to run as fast as possible. So what do you do in the batch analytics? You typically explore patterns and you try uh, to find models to experiment with your data. And you, all, you always do this based on historic data. So you first collect data, then you batch over this data. You try to crunch this data. You try to, to find a model and to fit everything that you have in the history into this one model. And, um, well, it's also about forecasting, like planning business for the, for the next year, but it's not about planning the next hour of the business. It's like planning the whole year, for example, or forecasting the, the, the whole year generally observing trends in the, in the historic data and so on and so forth. From the architectural perspective, it's when you typically synchronously query data. You can even separate it in smaller pieces, but you still are totally synchronous here. So you, you're actually waiting for your database, data store, however you call it, to deliver data that you asked for. It's when you, when you concern the main memory, of the machine, of the corresponding, it's when you typically use it for caching, like for fast querying and stuff like this. But there is much more than that, which is possible. But still, in the architectural perspective, um, it's relevant here. So when you do ETL, do any of you guys, does any of you guys do ETL data warehouse stuff and stuff like this? Anybody? Two, three? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> okay. But you, you are aware that there is something like data warehouses in the world, right? Yeah, I know we, we don't like these guys who are working with data warehouses. They always put, put some concerns on us, like constraints and stuff. They always expect star uh, structures and stuff like this. Okay, but these guys are doing real hard work, actually. So. When you're on Hadoop Rails, you actually do the same. It's, it's similar. Before you can even have this data in, in HDFS, which is the basis of Hadoop, the technical basis, you, you have to, to do ETL. However you call it, you can find a new name for this, but you still try to put this data from A to B and transform this data on its way. So it's actually ETL. Um, but it's not a cool term these days, so uh, you will probably find another one. Um, when you have large Amounts of historic data, the trick is to split it in smaller chunks and do data crunching on, in parallel on different machines. This is the basic trick. From the pure te purely technological point of view, it's when you work with RDBMSs, with relational database systems, or whatever database systems you work with, 
or it's also valid for NoSQL data stores uh, for most of them because you typically ask them for data synchronously. So I've told you that when you wait for the data store to deliver data synchronously, it's the way that I mean here. It doesn't matter if, it's, if this data store is a pure uh, data, a uh, pure file system, or if it's a uh, data store with a real API. It doesn't really matter. When you look at Hadoop and Core, you, you store this in HDFS. This is actually a virtual file system, so it's comparable to a data store on the lowest level possible. Um, and technology is, of course, about hardware. I mean, it's all about physics. When you rely on disks, when you want disks, when you need, need disks, so when your data is actually historic data on the disk, so this is when you're in the batch. Compared to this, what can be meant by near real-time or real-time, whatever, analytics? So the highest level, you don't have time. Well, remember Roadrunner. He needs to decide when, when a, uh, whatever this guy uses there, it's, it's uh, in front of his nose, he needs to avoid this uh, thing and run further. So you don't have time to decide. You need to decide immediately. And immediately means really immediately. Now. So that means that you analyze data as it comes. You don't wait for this data to be stored somewhere and you don't query this data. You analyze it as it comes on streams. So it only can work when you have a fixed model. You don't process chaos here. You don't crunch chaos like you would do in the batch trying to understand your own data. Here you exactly know what is coming in and you exactly know how to analyze it. So the model is 100% fixed. And when you react immediately or act immediately, whatever you do, it's based on patterns that you've learned in the batch, for example, but also it's possible to learn patterns on the fly. But most of them you will learn in the batch analysis. From the architectural perspective, what does it mean? You don't query your data, you just expect the data. I will explain this in more detail because this is probably the most shocking part um, to understand, but uh, I will do my best to explain it. Uh, the memory mutates into something that is absolutely important. So you, you, you don't work with disks or whatever, or not directly, for this historic data to be stored and to, to be read from. You use memory as your storage. Probably also shocking, but we will discuss um, uh, disaster protection stuff and so on, also briefly. Um, so you are on event streams on the so-called. And concerning distribution and parallelism, I've, I've, been, talking, I've been speaking about Erlang OTP today, uh, so, which, has, uh, n which has native, uh, um, well, mechanism for distribution. It's, it's natively implemented, it's embedded in the system. Actually, here in such systems, you distribute and parallelize only when you really have to. So the ideal case, you're staying on, the, on one single machine. If you can manage to push everything through this machine and to analyze this, you have one. As soon as you go for distribution, this will hurt, uh, start to hurt you in some ways that I will also explain here. Sorry. What does it mean in, in terms of technology? In terms of technology, it means that there are so-called DSMSs. It's data stream management systems. They're completely different. You can, uh, I can tell you about literature later, if you like. They are, they are built completely different. It's real it's systems working with streams with uh, corresponding algorithms that are uh, com partially completely different than what, from what you know from data mining and stuff. You don't use disks. You store only for archiving reasons, so you have this data in the store because we, I will also explain it's not possible to do everything in near real time, to analyze everything. You need to store it, but there are different storage uh, um, necessities. So no disks, or at least not for that, that you use them to analyze data. Um, distribution, real ideal distribution, is based on equal nodes. 
So we have like 100 computers in the whole system and they are all equal in what they do. They can on their own together decide who is the master right now, whatever, however you call it. The problem there is that it's then necessary that they, they gossip around. Every gossiping on the network layer will start, start to kill your performance there. So it's actually for different purposes. You need systems that are independent from each other and work more with, with stuff like, like cascading, not horizontal um, gossip. And the other thing is that you will have to do some further tricks, like GPUs, ever heard of them? Like NVIDIA stuff, right? So, um, yeah, you will have to go for accelerators like this because you need to be fast in, what, in how you analyze your data. You don't have time. So it's basically for complex math. Still with me? No problem. Okay, so near real time, what does it mean? I mean, there is this, uh, there has been this, this, uh, um, uh, yeah, this piece in this, in this series where this guy tried to, well, he actually, Acme has produced a, a, a suit where he could look like a female roadrunner. So he, his plan was to attract the male roadrunner. Well, we don't really know if he's male or not, but this was the plan. They never said that this was a boy, so uh, whatever that means. Um, so he has this female roadrunner thing and he tries to attract the roadrunner and he was actually attracted, but it didn't work at all. Like it went completely wrong. So the message is here, you cannot do what you would call real-time or near real-time analytics based on the system which is there to do batch analytics. They are completely different things absolutely different things. It, it doesn't matter how hard people who are in, in the Hadoop world, they are doing a great job to accelerate it, to accelerate processing. It's still only then near real time when you would call near real time something that, that's faster than, than you can make a coffee or something. It's fast, but the real time as it is doesn't have anything to do with how fast the system is. This is very important. I will have a slide on real-time and explain what real-time actually means. So near real-time, let's near, call it near real-time, it's pretty tricky. So you're building a non-blocking, lock-free, event-driven system. Still with me here? Absolutely non-blocking algorithms. So even if you have consumers and producers, they don't block each other. They are completely independent. There are algorithms for that, there are technologies for that that you can use even on, G on the JVM, so no worries here. Um, but it's not the way how we are used to think of systems. But these are these DSMSs, or however you call them, so systems that work with streams of events that never stop. They don't have to block, they are cascading, they, are, uh, they, they contain independent parts that, that can be driven by further events and higher order events and so on and so forth. So, Exactly, so this is actually, what does it mean to be real-time? Real-time has time in it, so it's time-bound. That means that even if something takes half an hour, it's real-time, okay? It means that this is exactly half an hour, not more than that. It doesn't have to be fast. When you rely on a system which does something exactly once a day, at the same time, on the level of nanosecond, this is real-time. Um, so what you have to do is you will keep everything you can in the memory, completely. When you don't keep it in memory, you will lose because this will make you unreliable. Unreliable in terms of time because you cannot predict the exact time, how long it will take to pick up the data from the disk. You still can plan with this uh, based on memory because these times are predictable. Uh, or at least much more predictable uh, than, than access time of a hard disk. So next is um, you need completely, to completely utilize resources of the machine, of one single machine. So ideal case is when you build a system which is running completely on one single machine. Probably it's stupid, right? So maybe it sounds stupid for you, for anybody, because it's boring. 
but it's not boring as you think. It's not as boring as you think. So try, go try, utilize the whole resources of one single machine. So you have 100% of the time, 100% of the CPU used. Did you ever achieve this, something like that? Probably by some uh, endless loops. But systems, these, systems and VMs these days are not that stupid, so they will block them out. They don't play a role anymore. Um, yeah, that's about the machine. And you need to fix the model, and you typically work with binary events. So no JSON, no XML, nothing like that, nothing that you have to parse. Parsing is not predictable. Parsing takes time, and parsing depends, at, again, on where the data comes from, how much is in there. So it has to be stable, it has to be complete, and it has to be typically binary. Why? Because we have a very complex stack in our industry. The stack starts with hardware. It starts with networks. And on the network layer, you have things like MTUs that you have to deal with. MTUs are, have a limited size. When you exceed the size, the whole TCP IP stack will have to retransmit the data or will have to, to uh, reorganize the data, set it in order when you work with different uh, fragments and stuff like this. You would like to avoid this, so everything that you send as a complete event fits completely in one MTU. This is very important. And it goes on and goes on. It goes through all the memory layers. I mean, it's not about memory that we have here. I mean, we have main memory like, like um, well, what you would call a main, uh, main RAM, uh, yes, main memory of a computer, but we also have different caches. And those different caches, before data reaches the processor to be computed uh, or used, they are pretty complex. They also are organized in cache lines and stuff like this. So if you didn't know this, you should read it up. It's pretty complex how, how the memory of a machine is actually built. So what does it mean to scale a real-time or near real-time analytics system? Scaling is very important. It's hard to scale when you have hit the limit. But what you can do, well, actually, it's, it's similar to, to parallelizing on one machine and on scaling on a distributed way, but it's, it's sort of specific. So you scale through logical or physical, however you do it, a stream split. So a stream is anyway something logical. It has probably a physical representation like, like a socket, but still you can split this, you can have balancers up front that would split a stream in three parts, for example, send every third of this whole stream to one machine, and so on and so forth. Based on some logical um, attribute, those of you who have attended the, the, um, the MongoDB uh, talk or the workshop will know the concept of the sharding, so it's actually similar to sharding. You shard based on some sort of key, and ideally you do this in a, in a, uh, um, in a way that's, uh, that everything is symmetric. So, online, uh, online scatter gather and the like, so scatter gather is also, uh, this is, this is a, a, a more complex, more advanced uh, concept here. How, how to split, so the logic of, of splitting a stream can be more complex. This is what I want to say with that. Um, this is very important that pieces that you have used for computation, like 10 machines, for example, when you have split everything, they have to be completely independent from each other, 100% independent. They shouldn't talk to each other in any way. They shouldn't talk to a master about anything. They just do a piece of work and propagate this piece of work to the next step. Is it any clear? Does it make sense? I don't hear no, so I just go on. Receive and forward, fire and forget, cascading, multicast. Multicast is a pretty cool feature. So you use actually the, net, the features of your network stack to do computations. What you can do in order to parallelize computations is, for example, you just have 10 machines and they do all the same, and you let, you let one win. Sounds stupid, sounds like waste of machinery, but still, the first one who will deliver the next event has won. The others have just do compu uh, have, have done computation. 
but still it's better than waiting all the time on one single machine that is probably overloaded or has a hardware problem or whatever. And well, role-based, you can, you can even have a logic based on role-based, so you have like five machines doing that, seven machines doing that, and so on and so forth. So variations are possible here. How do you survive in the near real-time world, world? Because actually, you cannot expect that an analytical system is only there for analytics and there is something else that has the, the data. So you probably would, I'm out of time. How many, how much? 10 minutes? 15, 15. okay, great. So we have agreed. Um, what was that? Yes, so, um, Surviving means that you probably built a system which also has to store events. Probably these events are very important for your enterprise. Like when you have a web analytics platform or something like this. So you probably want to, to preserve, to store all conversa uh, conversions, all uh, uh, clicks and whatever. It's also a storage system actually, but it also does analytics. So it brings some challenges. How about disaster recovery and stuff like this? I know some guys here in the audience who have asked these questions already in the past. So it's, yet again, you would split streams, you would have redundancy, and some parts of the system are there to store, or, well, they are dummies, like, just imagine two machines. The stream goes in, and it's always the same stream that goes to both machines. It just gets 100% split, like, you get the whole stream and you get the whole stream as well. And it's role-based split. That means that one of the machines does computation, the other one just doesn't, but it has the events. So it can preserve in memory one hour, for example. So you can switch over and use this hour of events later. So how about short-term short uh, term failure recovery? So you would actually build a system where you have upfront, you have a component which takes all the events and just stores on disk in a very, well, let's say, spartanic way, just store the events in their raw form on disk, just so you can replay these events one hour of events later, if you realize that one hour has got lost, for example during the current computation. So you, have, you can work with message, message queues there and stuff like this. So those message queues are able to store the data uh, on disks and replay them afterwards. You can also penalize events, but it's uh, probably beyond the uh, scope of the talk. So near real time, it's, it's pretty limited what you can do in near real time from the analytical perspective, for example. So, I mean, it's, it's all about computer science, it's all about mathematics. So, when you, ha when you run an algorithm which expects a sample, there is no way to avoid the sample. It's pretty simple. I mean, it's mathematics. So, sample means like I need a basis of 200 events, whatever you do with them. So, what you do with streams, you cut them in windows. And windows can have different forms, like for example, the most important thing is sliding window. Sliding window just moves forward. For example, one second, or with every event, it just moves forward. Basically, under, under the hood, it's nothing else but a uh, circular buffer. It's limited, so whenever more events come in, it starts from the beginning, and so on and so forth. Um, but you also have things like, like tumbling window, which dies after a time and starts to grow up to a limit and so on and so forth. What is real important when you build systems like this is that from the analytical perspective, many things become or have to be done uh, approximately in a probabilistic manner, in a probabilistic way. That means that when you start collecting top uh, targets for clicks, for example, it can become that much. Just imagine Google, when Google would always reliably count the clicks and present the number of the clicks, probably they, they will not be able to, to, um, to manage the system. 
what they do, there are algorithms that allow you to approximate this. So they work with limited also windows where the counter or the top list, whatever, is reliable. And afterwards they work with approximation where a small representation of what has happened in the past is being stored, is being pulled around all the time. And you can actually well approximate how often or if at all this one has been seen by the customer, for example, and so on. So what you can do when you do, do analytics on stream process, uh, on streams, is bas basically you predict the near future. You don't predict the next year because you have a stream and it's now. Do you remember, do you guys remember the movie, De Deja Vu, it's called Deja Vu with Denzel Washington. It's like go f uh, four and a half days uh, in the past and observe what has happened and see in parallel. I will also use this concept to, on another slide to explain a pretty uh, interesting concept to you. But this is actu actually what you do. You, you observe the stream. You can only react on the stream and plan the next steps based on this current stream. So what about mining? Well, you can do stream mining, but well, the, the vision is, is, is limited. Remember Roadrunner, narrow vision field? So you only see a piece of the road, and this is actually something that you would build upon and that, that, that you can use at all. So this is actually your current window, and you see only this. You can have a window which is complex, which, which combines several streams, but it's still a limited window in size or in time, or however you solve this. But basic algorithms known from data mining, do I have data mining guys here? No. Pretty, pretty impressive stuff, though it sounds boring. But they use algorithms like a priori and one class SVM, which is for anomaly detection and k-means for dynamic clustering of data, like find patterns is a priori, for example, find patterns like people who click this, this, and this tend to do this. Yeah, we are in the, in the world of big data. I mean, it's all algorithms here. Yeah. All the regressions to, to predict trends and stuff like this. It's, it's uh, uh, all about math. So, as long as it fits into main memory, you win. You're fast. You can do this reliably. And it's similar to what you do with classic data mining. But the very important thing is that batch and near real-time processing don't exclude each other. They don't have to. One example is the Lambda architecture uh, described in his big data book by, by a former Twitter engineer, by Nathan Mars. It's pretty cool to understand how, how you can separate these two topics. You have different views. You have a view on historic data and they have the view on, on now. But you can combine them. And this is the real cool thing. So what we can actually learn from guys from high frequency trading and stuff like this, how they work. They, ha they have a bunch of historic data. Do you know about high frequency trading? You know those guys who manipulate the markets and, and, and all the shares and stuff? Like put 2,000 orders on market and see what happens. Yeah, this, these guys are responsible for, you know, for this curve on markets. But anyway, uh, I'm not bashing, any, uh, bashing anybody. Uh, yeah, so um, this is very important. What they do, they collect like three, uh, three years of data and then they use this data to train the algorithms to find out factors. So when, when you don't know about algorithms, algorithm trading or fitting, however you call it, when you don't know about this, you should probably read it up. I don't have time to explain this in detail. But still, you train some algorithms, find some, some features, find some, some factors and stuff like this, and you use this then in your near real-time analytic system. So you actually use an algorithm. That, that algorithm is prescribed then. It's only to be used but it's found and trained in the batch. How about no batch? Well, it's possible to do a lot of stuff on, uh, with, completely without batch. The main trick is, we, well, we can probably discuss this uh, argument that database is always the bottleneck in any system. Probably it's not, uh, it's not true anymore, or at least not for every store, but in order to be reliable, completely reliable, you need to turn around the processing. You need to turn around the way how you ask your data store for data. You don't wait synchronously, as I told you. You have to implement mechanisms that allow you to stream the data straight from the data store to your processes. Understand the difference? It's pretty tricky to implement, but 
it's very it's possible it's possible on different data stores the trick is even everything is an event everything is a stream of events you can preserve the original time for historic data or you can just blow it on it doesn't matter um, how you do this but you, you still have a stream of data so the, the message is don't query your database when you build a new real-time analytics system you don't have time to query it you need to turn around the processing or the, 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 the query mechanism. So let's briefly talk about example tools. It's pretty difficult to classify them in some way. So examples are stuff like Splunk and PostStream and Impala and Drill. Those are uh, things that make Hadoop for different stacks, like for different, uh, um, well, from different uh, vendors, faster but it's still not real-time, what you would call real-time. They are query store-oriented or passively adapting, whatever, blah, 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 so they work on, 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 on logs or however you call it. Full-blown CP engines. You know about CP, complex event processing? Those guys that, that manage all the railways and stuff like this, like semaphores and so on. Yeah, it's a, they are full-blown, they, they are complex, they have a known language uh, that you have to use. And uh, you, can, you can do it more, more simply if you have this possibility to do this. So examples are even stream-based and ASPA. For example, there are more pragmatic stream processors like Storm and S4 and, and uh, Samsa is something new from, from LinkedIn. I didn't look at it, but it sounds promising. And also, uh, well, cloud-based or not cloud-based, whatever, KidIO is cloud-based. You just send events in there and you can do analytics on events. Sounds pretty cool. And also something that I'm working on with a couple of guys here in the company, if you're interested in, in this, we can talk about this, but I'm not allowed to speak of details. So all the slides are details about that. <laughs> well, so how to do this yourself? What is the technology that you would use? Remember, non-blocking, uh, event-driven, reactive, and stuff like this. So there are, there are technologies. You don't go for, for ActiveMQ on however you call these big, fat GMS guys. Uh, you, you, go, you go with, with pretty small, even zero middleware approaches, like zero MQ or nano MSG and whatever. Or well, Disruptor is also a queuing system written by, actually, by high-frequency trading guys. Um, ideally, you keep everything in one single process. That sounds stupid, I know, but one single process that completely utilizes the whole resources on one single machine. This is ideal. That's real cool. So you will have to, in order to work with several cores, you will have to parallelize stuff on one machine. You will have to work with threads, and that it's, it will get hairy. It's not that simple. Context switch and stuff like this. Um, what about memory? This is a real tricky part about memory. You will probably offload this in, uh, when you do it on the JVM, for example, you would offload this outside the managed heap. So the way you did this with C, did anybody program in C a while back? Or still doing that? One, two, hey, no worries, it's still alive. Okay. So GPUs, uh, when, you, when you're in the Java world, there is a cool library called root beer. I'm slowly getting there. To, to test it and to check it out, how it works. Um, the important thing about analytics, algorithms that you get with libraries, these pre-built algorithms, that are not, they are not cascading, they don't use many tricks that you have to use um, in, in systems like this. So you will end up implementing algorithms on your own and uh, you, will, you will have to embed them in this process. So no foreign uh, external systems that, that run analytics, whatever. Um, briefly about base, basic technology. So the, the message is that I find the JVM to be, after several experiments, real hard experiments, I find the JVM to be the real, the most interesting thing, the most interesting platform for building applications like this. I don't claim that this is perfect for everything, but for applications like this. Because you can do on the JVM, you can program the way you did this in C, and C, C++ is the first choice of high frequency traders, for example, but not anymore. You get the JIT compiler and you also get some, some further tricks that you can use there. Probably your programmers are not that good, so they wouldn't do them in C, uh, you know, stack and stuff. So um, 
that's actually the trick. The JVM, a good JVM, um, will give you a lot more than just the possibility to write C similar code. So Erlang, for example, is, is good for glue, but uh, I've, I've told you, um, I, I gave this talk this morning. So Erlang is glue for, uh, good for glue, but it's not, you cannot really integrate it with anything except Erlang or C. So it's not very comfortable. So the message is JVM is cool for that. Programming languages. The very message is when you build systems like this, go functional, even more, go functional reactive. Ever heard of reactive programming? It's a complete turnaround. You, re you react on things. When the mouse moves, the mouse pointer moves, you get notified that this happens. You don't pull this data actively. You don't ask for this data. Where is the mouse? So the whole system is completely based on events, and there are only reactors that react on things. Functional languages are pretty cool because they offer the way to compose functions. And this is pretty cool to implement uh, stream processing because you can postpone the actual processing step to the latest possible point of time, composing functions in the code and just calling with one event, calling the whole chain with a result behind. So objects are not with methods and stuff, they, they don't feel right here to do this sort of processing. JavaScript can do some tricks of that, but it's, it's still maturing in my, uh, uh, from my point of view. Erlang and Clojure and Scala and Core are far, are further with that, uh, how far you can go using that. So pure Java might be a healthy trade-off. There are frameworks like reactive extensions and Reactor. We don't have time to get uh, uh, into this in depth, but you can probably just uh, Google the names and find out what they do. And again, about time, time is time. So time must be reliable. Um, it's very interesting. You cannot do explicit interrupts on the JVM still. I mean, the system is not for that. So you will still approximate. I mean, it, they have different sort of, sorts of timers. And one of them is a very good approximation when you want to go on the millisecond level. Um, but for example, systems like Node.js and Erlang, it's just a pure approximation when you actually get the event of the timer that has happened. So when you're building a system which has to rely on milliseconds and you get one event 300 milliseconds later, but still in the same second because you set it up on the second level, the, VMs, it's, the VM itself will do its best to push this event to you, but when it's under high load and it has a lot to do, it will not manage to do this. It will not interrupt you and, and it will not be able to give you the, uh, the way to interrupt it. So C is basically the winner here, but as I told you, on the JVM you can write C closed code and when you, when you do this and when you do this with the right solutions, with the right frameworks, you can even get more and more reliable there. Um, I have explained to you this trick with turning around how you query the data. I, I'm a very big fan of NoSQL. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm also kind of helping pushing this, this uh, for different reasons. But look at this name. I say Oracle and whatever data store. They have in, built in feature called jobs and you can use, the only thing that you need is active components in the data store itself. Even if the data store is distributed, on every single node you will have an active component. Active component means that when the active component has to deliver data, it will get an event on a, well, on a queue or whatever, and then will react on this event having predefined views or scans or queries, however you call them, and starting pushing uh, matching events from the data store over to your processes in the whole chain. This is how you would re, uh, how to implement it uh, technically. And let's briefly talk about business cases. When do you do stream processing or real-time analytics? When does it, when do they fit? Anomaly detection, outlier detection, it's the same names for any sort of system. Like compare the now to the same period of time three weeks ago. What did change? Do we have an anomaly in the system? Does it misbehave? 
probably we have an attacker here or whatever. And this is the next one, fraud detection. It's, it has complex patterns, so you cannot find any, a, every sort of fraud in a near real-time system. You will have to go for batch to analyze this, to find patterns, and then you apply them to the real-time system. And this can find frauds based on some patterns in the data streams. Situational pricing, just imagine you want to adjust prices dynamically. Yeah, you are Amazon and you have like competitor, for example, well, some shoe store, which is very uh, popular, and you want to adjust prices based on what they do. So when they adjust prices, you get notified about this, events get, get into the system about this price changes and you automatically adjust prices based on what they did and what you, how far you can go actually with your prices. Product placement, like place a product on the home page if, uh, if it doesn't get reached fast enough, often enough and stuff when you want to push it. Stock inventory control forecast and so on and so forth is pretty simple. Online bidding, we have guys here with online bidding. So actually it goes in, in, this, in a similar direction, this sort of systems. Uh, automated traffic optimization. Traffic is very dynamic, so, so like rerouting, for example. Avoid hot spots. <laughs> Something that a CDN, for example, would do, and they all also uh, already do this for years, like Akamai. So when they have, in the whole internet, when they have hot spots, hot areas that are getting, getting attacked or whatever, your, um, your requests will get rerouted through other routes, through other servers and so on, so you can avoid this. Um, Semi-automated operations is when, when you don't want to actually um, only to offer graphs moving around, but you want to notify an operator to do some stuff based on, on what you find, found in the data. And also this immediate visualization, which is pretty cool. I mean, we have the company called Splunk. Ever heard of Splunk? I mean, they are visual, basically they are visualizing logs. But it's pretty cool because logs are, uh, well, totally ignored for years everywhere. And now people can see the truth in the logs. Like, wow, when in Apache this happens, and in Tomcat happens this, wow, we have like behavior like this. So it's awesome. They still don't know what to do with this, but it's visualiz visualizing everything. Yeah, anyway, so this, this is what you actually would do. So you have operators who look, observe the matrix. And well, that's, Basically, basically, why you should go for speed, maybe. Um, well, I mean, why not? I, I'm not trying to convince anybody saying that your competitors are already doing this, because this is a pretty stupid argument. I cannot prove this. Well, in some cases I can, but in this case I will probably name them. But the problem is that the world nowadays has become real fast real fast. We are making decisions based on million factors, but our brains are limited in what they can do there. So we will use machines, and we use machines for that, to prepare at least decisions, to prepare some options for us. And in order for them to do this, they need to work similarly like our brains work, and our brain, brains cascade. They split first in, in, in two different parts, like is it the visual information or is it the logical information? And then it goes, goes through the whole uh, left or, or right side of the brain with the processing being cascaded down to muscle, muscles or whatever. 